Welcome. This is the last lecture for this chapter, and this one will be a little shorter than the other ones. Uh, but it, you do need to pay attention to make sure that you understand this topic because you're going to be having to write about this. So you're going to have a writing assignment this week, and it is going to be based on the Columbian Exchange. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention. And as with the other ones, uh, you will have question. You will have one question to answer for this one. So you will have one more question. It's four questions, not five. So section three is about the global exchanges that take place. And the events that take place following Columbus's voyages are going to really create a much different world, and they're going to have an impact throughout the planet. And that's what we're going to focus on in this section. So question number four is for you to understand what were some of the positive aspects of the Columbian exchange and what were some of the destructive aspects. So I want you to be able to know both the positive the ways that, that there was positive contributions of this exchange, as well as some of the destructive aspects of this exchange. So you need to really know what the Columbian Exchange. So let's get to this and let's get one thing clear. The Columbian Exchange is not a trade route. Okay? A lot of people are going to confuse transatlantic trade for Columbian Exchange. Okay? This is not a trade route. It is not a trade pattern. There's no engaging in, hey, I'll trade you some honeybees for some syphilis, right? Or, hey, how about if I give you some smallpox, you give me some tomatoes. That's not what this is. This is the accidental and sometimes uh, intentional biological exchange that takes place after the voyages of Columbus, Hence the name Columbian Exchange, right? Because of Christopher Columbus. When the people of the Eastern Hemisphere engaged in interaction with the people of the Western Hemisphere, you brought, you brought together two biological zones of planet Earth that had been isolated from each other for tens of thousands of years. So in those tens of thousands of years that these, that these two hemispheres had been separated biologically, you had animals that didn't exist. You know, the American horse had died out tens of thousands of years in the past. Um, you had plants that didn't exist in the Americas and plants that didn't exist in Europe, right? And, and there was no way for them to diffuse because people did not engage in interaction between the two hemispheres. So you had two distinct zones. Now here's where we look at understanding why this is going to have the impact it has. Okay, Eurasia, Afro-Eurasia, is located, or its geographic setting is very wide. There's a lot of land east to west. And a lot of land east to west is going to give you very similar climate. So there's a much longer history of diffusion of crops and interaction of people and biological zones, plants, flowers, trees, animals. And they engaged with each other. So they spread germs to each other that they were immune to. In addition, most of the world's largest, large and domesticatable animals were located in Afro-Eurasia. Cows, sheep, pigs, horses, goats. Those didn't exist in the Americas. So in Afro-Eurasia, people had been living with these animals for thousands of years. So they had a thousands, thousands of years of a head start in acquiring diseases and germs from these animals and had built up immunities to them, immunities that don't exist in the Americas. So when the, when the Europeans arrived and began to colonize the Americas, they carried with them diseases that the people of the Americas had not been exposed to. Diseases like smallpox, influenza, malaria, whooping cough, measles. Okay? And they introduced them to populations that were very vulnerable because they had never seen them, so they did not have the immunity to these diseases. So that's going to be one of the impacts, is going to be germs. But there's other forms of biological exchange. The Europeans bring with them cattle, sheep, pigs. So th again, these are not trade routes. They're not trading cows. They're not bringing. They're not constantly bringing cows. They're bringing a couple of cows, and those cows are reproducing. 
they're bringing you know a bunch of pigs and pigs reproduce really fast and they have large litters so pretty soon pigs you know there's pigs are reproducing so you're bringing you know male and female animals on the ships but once you're there you're mating those animals so it's not a trade but it's it's an introduction of that um, so honeybees, sugarcane, bananas, citrus fruits, pears, coffee beans. And then they're, they're also coming across foods that they had never seen. Pumpkins, tobacco, quinine, avocados, potatoes, beans, peanuts, tomatoes, corn, vanilla. And they're introducing them into Europe for the first time. Okay. So if you think about like just looking at this image, if you think like, Italian food and you think of pasta with this, you know, that wouldn't have existed without the tomato sauce. Okay. Um, or you think of, um, you know, in, in the Ottoman Empire, people sm smoking tobacco out of a pipe. That tobacco didn't exist before. And if you think of, you know, a lot of people, you know, coffee, you know, I have my coffee every morning. Coffee didn't exist here. And now, most of the, you know, I think some of the best coffee comes from is grown in Central America and in South America. Sugar did not exist here. You guys, you know, wheat, when you think of harina, rice, you know, one of the, one of the Mexican staples, you know, my mom grew up on beans, rice, and Jesus Christ. And out of those, only one of those is native to the Americas and the other two were not. So the Columbian Exchange is this inadvertent introduction and exchange of biological forms of life, you know, things that are living, plant, animal, disease, right? Pathogens that take place and they're going to shape the world. So for example, one of the impacts of the Columbian Exchange, you could see how it is going to impact the population of Mexico. When the Spaniards arrived in 1518, there were about 20 million people, native people in Mexico. By the end of the conquest, by 1533, it was 17 and a half, and by 1548, less than 5 million. By 1593, almost 1%, right, or 1 million people, sorry, only of indigenous descent because of smallpox, because of the disease. Now, during this time, by 1593, there's going to be a larger Mexican population, but it's now going to be composed of European, African, and mixed people, people that are mixed with Indians or Africans or Europeans. So you're going to have a population replacement, but you're going to see a decimation of Native people within a, a hundred years of the conquest because they were not immune to the smallpox and it hit them very hard and almost everyone who got it would die of it. So, right, if you think about it, right, if 25 people got it, 24 of them are going to die. And that happens throughout the Americas over the course of 100 years. So there's a saying you might have heard in, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. But there's another one that says by 1535, no Arawak was left alive because those were the first people that were ravaged by the disease were the people on the Caribbean islands. So that's going to be one of the impacts. It's going to happen in North America a little later when the British arrive, right? The disease spreads by people that are moving around. But then when the British arrive and start establishing ports, you also see a rapid spread of smallpox in the 1600s and 1700s in North America. So that's going to be one of the negative impacts that you're going to see is the decimation. But you're also going to see um, other negative impacts on the environment because of the, the agricultural exchanges, right? And I know, you know, this is making you hungry, right? But think of like things that we enjoy today, horchata, right? We think of a Mexican drink, but it's made with rice. That didn't exist before this. Pizza, as we enjoy it, right? The tomatoes, the peppers on there were from the Americas. And the wheat for the dough and the cheese from the cow came from Europe. So we look at carne asada burritos, Right, the aguacate, the guacamole is from here. The salsas, part of it is from here. But 
That tortilla, the flour tortilla, they didn't have flour here. The meat inside, the carne asada, that came from Eurasia. The potato was here, so if you're having a California burrito, the potato was here, but the oil you fried in was from Afro-Eurasia. So what this exchange does is, one, it diversifies diets all over the world. Everywhere in the world is going to see a population explosion. China's population is going to grow because the sweet potato is going to be introduced and it's going to become a staple for a lot of the poor people of China. Rice is going to be introduced to the Americas and beans. Corn is going to be introduced and it's going to supplement the feeding of animals. And it's going to lead to the more animal populations for food. So everywhere in the world, and, and what you're going to see when you study every chapter in this unit, when you get to chapter 24, 26, 27, even 25, which talks about the Americas, 28, which talks about the Islamic world, everywhere you're going to see the impact of American crops. Crops that came from the Americas and are introduced into Eurasia are going to increase the population because it's going to increase the food supply and the diets of the people. In the Americas, the population is going to grow, but it's going to grow because of immigration from Afro-Eurasia and, and mixing with the indigenous people. But the native population is going to see a rapid decline. But global population will go up. And by 1750, by the end of the unit, we're going to be pushing close to a billion people, which will hit a little bit after 1800 for the first time. So I said some, some other negative impacts are going to be the ecological impact because you're now taking a crop that didn't exist and you're planting it somewhere new. So you're having to change the landscape and you're, you're beginning to replace things that naturally grew in one region with something else. And in some places, you're going to see the formation of monocultures where in the Caribbean, you're going to get rid of everything that used to grow naturally just to cultivate sugar, right? And that's going to have an impact environmentally. And the growth of population is going to also impact the natural environment. It's going to lead to more decimation or more degradation, I should say, of the environment. Okay? So make sure you understood the Columbian Exchange and be ready to write about it later this week. That is it for this presentation.